morning. My name is Theo Young. I'm one of the pastors here at Wellspring, and I'm honored to get to lead our Compassion Ministry, which is our church's concerted efforts to care for the poor and the needy um, right here in Inglewood. I'm also honored this morning to be exploring the book of Philippians with you all. So our passage today is in chapter 1, verses 12 through 26. I'll give you a moment to turn there. Towards the end of the Second World War, a young German pastor sat in a prison outside of Berlin. He was there because of his involvement in a plot to overthrow Adolf Hitler. This was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. While in prison, he ministered to other prisoners. He wrote an amazing amount of scholarly papers and personal letters to friends and family and colleagues that were dear to him. He found partners in ministry both inside and outside the walls that would smuggle these letters wherever they needed to go. Contained within these works are prayers such as this, Lord, I do not understand your ways, but you know the way for me. Just before the end of the war, Bonhoeffer was sentenced to death without a fair process of law, and in his dying, he was remembered to have told a close friend, this is the end. But for me, the beginning of life. Where does that joy come from? The temperament of joy in the face of trials and trouble and suffering. Our passage today is going to provide us with the answer to that question. Before we enter the text, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are overjoyed to be in your presence this morning. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy and grace We ask, Holy Spirit, that you move within our hearts so that we can receive the word that you have for us. And Jesus, I ask that you be with me as I preach. Lord, may your gospel be proclaimed. Amen. Amen. Our passage begins, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of my brothers and sisters have become more confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. So to provide a bit of background context here, Paul is writing to the church that's in Philippi, who he's known and loved for close to a decade at this point. This church has been faithful in prayer, gifts, and support, not only to Paul's ministry, but to the whole church throughout the world. Paul's situation is that he's imprisoned for causing an uproar in the city of Jerusalem among the religious leaders and crowds. He was imprisoned by Roman uh, soldiers, and because of the fact that he was a Roman citizen, he was actually given a Roman trial process. As a result of that process, he would spend the next four years of his life in some sort of confinement, first in Caesarea and then in Rome. There's good reason to believe that Paul is writing to the Philippians from his time in Rome, where he was under a sort of house arrest. Now, this is not a sit back, enjoy a couple years off of ministry. Paul was in chains for the gospel. In fact, the common Roman approach to house arrest was to directly have a Roman soldier chained directly to their prisoner. Connie and I were joking that this is kind of like the ancient version of an ankle monitor. (laughs) But I have many friends who would say that that type of confinement, an ankle monitor, is in no way freedom. You are closely supervised and watched everywhere you go. On top of that imprisonment, the threat of his trial going the wrong way and resulting in his death was highly likely. So here we have Paul, attached to a Roman soldier, facing death, writing a letter to his beloved partners and ministry. And once he gets done with the introduction, which we covered last week, he turns to more of a personal update on his life. And I marvel that the first thing he shares is not, hey guys, the bar and the window is loose. The guard sleeps at 8 p.m. Get me out of here. Or, I hate this. I can't believe that I'm going through what I'm going through. I'm supposed to be out there proclaiming the gospel, but I'm chained in here in prison. No, what we get is Paul's word of rejoicing. What has happened to me here has actually advanced the gospel. 
He can't wait to tell the Philippians about this joyous reality. And this statement reveals that the root and center of Paul's heart is the goodness of God. Paul is teaching his partners in the gospel what it means to be a faithful follower of Jesus, even in the midst of trials and trouble. It's to be a person of joy. This is not an artificial, artificial sense of joy. Just put on a positive attitude. You'll make it through the day. This is true life-giving joy, bursting from deep within him. And it's a built upon a trust in God's plan and his goodness and a hope of redemption. While Paul is imprisoned, he's able to see that this is actually an opportunity for the advancement of the kingdom. He is quite literally chained to someone who cannot help but hear the gospel day in and day out. In verses 13 through 14, he says, it is because of my chains that the gospel is being advanced among the palace guard and it is giving my brothers and sisters confident hope to proclaim the gospel. What a powerful testimony of the way that God can take our trials, our sufferings, our challenges and circumstances and transform them into a platform for his good plan. This is who God has proven himself to be time and time again throughout the story of the scriptures. We should be reminded of the story of Joseph when we read this passage. He was sold by his brothers into slavery, wrongly accused, imprisoned, abandoned, left to die, yet he was not forgotten by the Lord. And through him, he saved an entire generation of people from starvation. When, his, when he was reunited with his brothers, they thought they were that they thought he was going to kill them. But he said, am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish his purposes, which is the saving of many lives. You see, Joseph had learned to trust in the goodness of God, even in the midst of the worst moments of his life. And he saw those moments become transfigured to bring about the glory of God Friends, our God can take the worst imaginable things and turn them into something that is good. Is there a trial in your life that God might be using as a platform for the proclamation of his gospel? Are you in a place of suffering, sickness, pain, loss, or despair this morning? I want to remind you that it is in our weakness that he is strong. And I want to encourage you to expand your imaginations about God's ability to bring light in darkness and life in death. Are you willing to believe that through what you are going through right now, God is being proclaimed? His glory and good news is being proclaimed in your suffering. We want often God's plan, we often want God's plan to be something that pulls us out of the pain we're experiencing or takes us out of harm's way. Yet God has chosen to bring about his redemption in the midst of a broken world. He doesn't take us out of it. His desire is that we be agents of a kingdom who can live in this world with a grounded belief in the goodness of God So much so that we're convinced that whatever is happening in our lives, God is at work. He has not abandoned us to the pit, as it says in Psalm 16. Poet Wendell Berry says it another way. It is the impeded stream that sings. The nature of God's kingdom is actually most clearly revealed in the midst of our difficulty. This is the type of kingdom where the poor, the mourner, the humble, the hungry, the merciful, the pure, the peacemakers, and the persecuted are called blessed. And more than that are encouraged to rejoice because the reward in heaven will be great. You see, Paul is beginning to realize more and more that his reward in the midst of suffering is Christ himself. Christ is our life. That is why, against all odds, we can hold on to a present joy in the midst of our suffering. Let's read on in the passage. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, verse 19, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ, 
What has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. So we know that at the root of Paul's joy is a trust in the goodness of God and God's capability and his track, work, track record of turning wrong things into right things. But these next verses reveal how Paul actually cultivates a spirit of joyfulness in the midst of his trials. How does he do it? By leaning on his relationships with his partners in ministry and his partner in the gospel, Jesus. Let's focus on the relationship he has with his partners in ministry first. Paul's relationship with the Philippians truly sustains him. It fills him with joyous hope. This is the church that has been there in the midst of the highs and lows of God's calling on Paul's life. They've committed to supporting his work through gifts and generosity, companionship, and most important to Paul, steadfast prayer. Prayer is the lifeblood of trust in God. It's the means by which our hearts are shaped and changed by the God who is ultimately good. In prayer, we cast ourselves upon this God, believing that in some way he will bring about his goodness. You see, Paul's thankful de dependence upon the prayers of the Philippians gives him a hope that the situation will turn out for his deliverance, and it gives him courage to be present in the experience of hardship that he is in. Paul's words, what has happened will turn out for my deliverance, are actually a direct quotation from the book of Job. Job is here clinging to a hope in the justice of God, knowing that he is not at fault for the incredible and absurd trials that he is going through. Job says these words to companions whose perception of God is misinformed, and as a result, do not encourage Job, but bring him to despair. Paul has placed himself in the position of Job by using these words and by knowing that the suffering and imprisonment he is currently facing can be used by God and that he is seen by God. Instead of being companions that drag Paul into despair, the Philippians are partners that hold on to hope for Paul, that support him in steadfast prayer. I wonder, what type of companion are you? Are you a friend to the hurting, a comforter to the broken, a partner in ministry to those who need to be pointed to Jesus in the darkest moments of their lives? Church, what type of companions are we? Do we hold those we love both inside and outside our community in steadfast prayer? If we're serious about being partners in ministry, we must pray. Barclay has a striking quote on prayer that says it all. We cannot call people our friends unless we pray for them. The cultivation of joy in the midst of suffering is founded upon prayer. We cultivate joy by leaning on the prayers of others, and we give joy, we offer joy to the suffering through our prayers for them. Now, you might be identifying with Paul's current plight, the one who is suffering or you might be companioning someone who's suffering right now, friends or family. Whether you are suffering or loving someone who is suffering, stay steadfast in prayer. Stay steadfast in prayer. Paul cultivates joy also by trusting in the provision of God through the Holy Spirit. How do we trust in God's provision in our daily lives? The answer is again, turning to prayer. As I was getting the sermon ready, I was reading through some books on prayer, and I found that there were two kind of primary perspectives about what prayer is actually doing in the midst of our suffering. The first idea highlighted that what prayer does is it allow us to be people who endure hardship. It changes our hearts in such a way that our posture towards the circumstances is able to be redeemed. This type of prayer leads to outcomes such as, I've learned to find that Christ is more present to me than I could have imagined. 
I have peace and turmoil. My love for my enemies has grown. That's one perspective on the work of prayer. Now, another perspective emphasizes that in prayer, we call upon the God of deliverance to change our plight, to change our circumstances. And in faith, we believe that he will make what is true in the kingdom of heaven true on earth. Here, prayer is for healing, deliverance, change of circumstance, and freedom from evil. So, which is it? What is God going to do through prayer? Bring about change in me or change in my circumstances? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Billy. (laughs) The answer is yes to both. Both, God's work is in both the internal and the external. Paul has learned to have joy in suffering because the Spirit's work is within him. And he's also learned to have hope in the redemptive power of the kingdom. If you are in a place of suffering today, do not despair in prayer. Do not give up. God is working in it to bring you into the person of Jesus, to shape you and mold you into the new humanity. God remembers your situation. He deeply cares for you. But also do not give up hope that he can bring about healing, that he can bring about restoration, that he can bring about joy where there was none before. Our God is great and powerful. Amen. Amen. The circumstances surrounding us do not tell us the whole story. From a kingdom perspective, God is at work in places we thought were impossible. To him, the outcome of Paul's situation is less important to him than knowing Christ in the midst of it. He faces the potential of death and laughs in its face, looking around at the world and saying, you want to tell me this is life? No, I have found life. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. This is the ultimate win-win. That's how the kingdom of God works. When we're united to Christ, we begin the life of the kingdom now, and we walk beside Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit, when death is then only a doorway into our sweet eternal communion with Jesus when for me to live is Christ to die is gain that is a win win that's why Paul with a straight face can tell the Philippians that he is in a situation that leads to a win but the Philippians may likely have been thinking he was a little crazy hey Paul wake up you're in prison you're facing death but Paul would say no I'm not crazy Nothing can separate me from the love of Christ, who is my life. Do we believe that, church? That nothing, death nor life, neither angels nor demons, present or future, nor any powers, height or depth, or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Friends, we can live our lives with the confidence that Paul has knowing that our circumstances do not dictate our destiny. We are held in the hands of a God who not only sees and knows us, but is working all things for good. And believe me, if it's good for God, it's good for you. So how do we cultivate joy and suffering? We lean on our partnerships with God and our partnerships with others in prayer. The final verses of this passage offer us insight into Paul's vulnerability and his love for this church. Let's remember this was a letter to family, not a theological treatise. And while there is so much we can gain from it theologically, the original intent is to share his heart before people he loves. So with that in mind, let's enter into verse 22 where we see some honesty from Paul. If I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet, what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better. But it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know I will remain and continue with you for your progress and joy in faith. Honestly, Paul wants to be done with his sufferings. The beatings, the jail time, the public shaming, the cold, the hunger, the exhaustion, and the hard work of following Jesus. He feels the not yet of of God's redemptive timing just as often as he feels the already. But again, he's found that there is deep joy within him because of who Christ is. He's not contemplating suicide here. 
He's actually anxiously awaiting being with Jesus. How sweet that must sound to someone who's experienced years of suffering to go be with the one you love. But when he looks around at his circumstances through the lens of Christ being his life, he's come to find that he's actually already content in Jesus. Jesus is his life. No matter what happens, life or death, he is with him. And that is truly the most important thing to Paul. And it ought to be for us as well. Now that's beautiful. But you are likely thinking, as I am thinking, that's Paul. Saint Paul, I am hurting. I am lost. I am overwhelmed. I am suffering and I actually don't know if I can keep going on. I need you to hear me say that the pain, the sufferings, and the trauma that we go through are not blessings from God. Some of us here have received wounds that are beyond imaginable and have received blanket statements such as, God's making you stronger through it or he's just trying to test you. But these perspectives severely limit God's redemptive presence with us in the midst of suffering and trouble. Now, God does not promise to give us a pain-free life, but what he does promise is to never leave us or forsake us. It is in the moments of deepest pain that the nearness of God becomes our greatest defense and our greatest place of vulnerability. We can cry out to him with our whole selves, where are you, God? How could you let this happen? I can't go on any longer. We can bring our whole selves to a God who hears and loves and has promised that we will see his goodness. A friend of mine who goes to this church told me last week, all my life I have yelled and brought my frustrations and anger out at God. But it dawned on me one day that if I'm yelling at someone, at least they hear me. At least they hear my cry. The pains of this life bring us to the place of realizing that Christ is the one who hears. He alone is our hope and suffering because he will never leave us and because he has also done something about the trials that we face. Your suffering is not right. It is not all right that some of you are sick and dying. It is not all right that there are some among us who have faced abuse and may be returning to it today as you leave. My friends in the well, it's not all right that you look towards this coming winter with despair, imagining and preparing for cold, sleepless nights, fighting for your life. It's not all right that there are people wrongly accused in prison. It's not all right that our brothers and sisters across the world face persecution for believing in Jesus. And let me tell you, it was not all right that Jesus was bound, beaten, and taken to his death upon the cross unjustly. And yet... Somehow through that cross, God has brought about redemption for all the world. Even now, Jesus' blood speaks a better word of God's mercy to us in the midst of our suffering. In that place of ultimate brokenness where God himself died for all that is not right, he began to set things right. Church, that is our hope We place our hope in the God who gave himself up for us, who took everything wrong in the world and for the joy set before him, which is you and me. He endured the most unimaginable suffering to secure our hope, to set us free, to give us life with him and life in him. Paul's joy comes from the joy of Jesus Even when departing and being with Christ seems like the more appealing option, he deeply longs for God's will to be done in his life. So he remains steadfast with the Philippians. Paul's joy is Jesus' type of joy, the not my will but yours be done, Lord, type of joy. Let us follow in that example to take on the posture of Jesus when we go through our own trials, to humbly come before our Father with honesty saying, Lord, I'm done with the suffering. I want to depart. I want to be with you. I want to receive your blessings, your abundant goodness. 
but not my will, yours be done. I will find you in the midst of this broken place. My friends, there is no more beautiful reality than finding Jesus in our brokenness. The Bible does not tell us to put on a smile and face the day. We are given a true hope in Jesus that in one day he will transfigure our pains by his good work of redemption. Wellspring, in this world you will have trouble. But take heart, Jesus has overcome the world. Let's pray.